When I was younger, when I was younger Didn't have the hunger I have now Now I am older but I'm stronger And I no longer say someday somehow Running out of time Running through my prime Running past where I've been do you believe we have entertainment back in Las Vegas? And who better to discuss the opening of entertaining Las Vegas again? Clint Holmes. Hi, And, and Clint, I, I must mention, a little bit later on in our show, uh, Ken Henderson, uh -huh. who um, created this venue, Notoriety, that yeah. you're performing at. I you am. have been performing and will continue to perform at. Um, all downtown on Fremont Street. I mean, it's this is... Hey, it, I was. This I, is like the World Series. Again. I, I know. I was. I yeah. was in at the beginning because Ken is one of my closest friends. I was in as he was conceptualizing, and you, you'd come in, and 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 he'd say, "And over here, we're going to have it, and over there was going to be a, there's going to be like this." And, and what I admire is that he did it. <laughs> Do you, you have that kind of um, mind where somebody conceptualizes something that you can visualize it at the same I'm time? I'm more the conceptualizer. Uh -huh. I, 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 I have lots of concepts on songs, I, I write a lot of songs, and on shows. Uh, then I love to collaborate. Then I love to sit with somebody who has a, maybe a visual idea of what I'm hearing in right. my ears, in my brain. Um, uh, I don't know that I could conceptualize a set of theaters, for instance. You know what I mean? Um, but yeah. I, I, it's it's what I it's what all of us do. We're creators, right? But 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 this translates from a musical and background and yep. and, uh, and more of a visual and and uh, oral and and uh, auditory. I tell you, I, I wrote a, I wrote a play back in 1996, yeah. and uh, it was uh, produced at a, one of the great theaters back east, the Paper Mill Playhouse, which is off Broadway, uh, out just outside of New York, but a, a theater. You know, all the shows go. So, so I, I wrote the play. I co-wrote uh, all the music and worked with the producers. And then came the day when I walked in and saw the set. Because I, I, you know, they said, what do you see? And I, oh, so I walked in and they had uh, designed the set. And I just stood there and I went, oh, my God. Somebody took m my concept and made it visual. Mm -hmm. And it was incredibly exciting. Uh, and then they brought the costumes in. And, and then we were trying on costumes and they had visualized what the show sh would look like. So that's what I mean. Um, I'm not that guy that's gonna visualize the set. Right, but, but how about when you're visualizing a song? Yeah. When you're starting, I have an idea, have a, you know, a, yeah. you know, a chorus or something for a song. And, you, and you, in the very beginning of that thought process, and you then look down the road and how you hope it to be, to come out. I mean, well, sure. Gonna, yeah. There's a few ways I go about it. And, and I think, again, I, I think most songwriters are like this. I, have, I always have my phone, I always have my pad, and every idea, no matter how stupid it sounds, if it's an idea, I write it down, right? And then a, a lot of times I'll just be, have no idea, and I'll go, well, let me see what I had. And, and, and so, it, it, I, okay, I wrote a song called If Not Now When, right? Uh, it's become kind of an anthem for mm -hmm. me. Uh, the song was about, I had cancer. Um, and w once I got past the cancer, it hit me in the face. Okay, what are you going to do? And, and why are you hesitating to do things that you've known a long time you should do? And then it, I went, and if not now, when? I went, okay, that's a song. And I sat at the piano and, and literally wrote the song in a half an hour. It doesn't always happen that way. Right. But that's usually what springs it, is, is an idea. Uh, the other way, um, I'm writing um, what I hope will be a, a Broadway show with Frank Wildhorn, who wrote Jekyll and Hyde. This is the moment. This mm -hmm. is the day. Frank and I have been writing this. It's his concept. And he would tell me, this song needs to be about a girl sitting at the bar, and the guy walks in, and he sees her, and she resists him, but she finally dances with him. That's what the song's mm -hmm. got to be about. So that's another way to go about it. I have right. a, there's a concept, and I write to the concept. So those well, are kind it, of It's the kind ways. of like acting. In a, in a sure, way. absolutely. Yeah. And, and when you had that cathartic... Uh, um, moment after you had cancer. Yep. Did you have anything similar with the COVID situation? A lot of people have, you know, looked at life a little bit differently having been through COVID. You weren't really working, mm -hmm. you know, in the, in the true sense that you have been. Like, it, it didn't. It didn't spring a song in me, it, and I and I did sit down a couple times and mm -hmm. say, "There's, there's got to be something about it." Uh, honestly, Ed, I think uh, between Kelly and I, we were dealing with 
the real thing for so long. Mm -hmm. and, and so that it, it wasn't inspiring, it was frightening, and it, all our efforts went to getting past it because Kelly had a, a tough time with it. You know what I mean? I had it and got through it, but she had a tough time. So I, it never um, spurred that kind of thing that the cancer did. How about just in, in the way you look at life? Um, did you make any changes? Oh, yeah. Oh, big changes, yeah. Uh, it, it, in that way, it does. Mm -hmm. I can reference the, the, the uh, time I had cancer, because, uh, for instance, we were talking about this before. Uh, you know, I, I had been touching up, coloring my hair forever since I was thirty-five. Mm -hmm. You know, um, afraid to let it be what it was. So, so, uh, and uh, in the past few years, I was thinking I really would like to do that. Just let it go gray. Let it whatever it's going to look like. You know, I don't know mm -hmm. what it's going to look like. And COVID let me do it. And just the fact that as I did that. And then I came back out and started performing again. All the responses I got were, were people who said, oh, I love your hair, it looks great. It's oh, that like George Clooney look, man. Yeah, well, that's what Kelly kept saying. Yeah. Every time I think about it, she got two words, yeah. George Clooney, right? <laughs> I say, well, yeah, but I'm not George Clooney. Uh, so, so but, but that was kind of the inspiration yeah. for the show that I'm doing here at Notoriety is called the, the Regeneration Series. Which means what? To create again. Okay. okay. Um, and so it gave me the opportunity in this great, beautiful space to create literally what I wanted to do, which was to strip down in, in, in the sense that I only I have a piano player and a bass player. That's it. Uh, so, so everything has kind of an openness to it. Uh, and it's much easier to create new material when you don't have to create it for a full band. So we literally could say on the Thursday of the show, go, hey, why don't we do that? I have an idea and do it. You know, which you can't do, you know, normally. Right. So th this series has been has been that for me. Create finding new material, looking at co more contemporary material. Um, not where I came out the first day I did a show, and I said to the audience because everybody was looking at the hair, right? I said, <laughs> "Okay, this is the way I want to look, yeah. and you're going to hear me sing the songs that I want to sing," and they all applauded. And, and <laughs> but so so that's the whole regeneration thing for me right now. It's really yeah. exciting. You know, I look you look back on your career, um, you know writer, performer, recording artist, uh, Grammy nominee, vocalist, uh, um, talk show yeah. uh, entertainer. Um, wh which element is the most important to you? Wow, good question. Um, I, I would say the one word would be communicating, which can obviously be done on television yeah. and it can be done live on stage. Uh, the difference is live on stage, you get the immediate gratification. Mm -hmm. You get the people laughing at your jokes, applauding you. I, I say to people all the time, our job is mm -hmm. to walk on stage in front of however many people and for 90 minutes make them love you, right? Make them, yay! Mm -hmm. So that's, that's, that's a certain thing. When I had my TV show, I loved it because every day we, we, we would create a new show. I'd go in, the producers would say, oh, here's your guest, here's what you're right. doing, here's the song. Five o'clock, we'd tape the show, I'd go home with a book that's, that I had to read for the next, right. and every day you created a new show. I love that too. Um, and the writing thing is, is kind of the opposite. It's, it's lonely, uh, it's, it's uh, uh, Steven Spielberg, uh, you've heard of him. Not, not, I'm sorry, not uh, Steven Sondheim. 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 Uh, he did a show in New York, well, he was on film, and it was about the songs he'd written. And he came out and he said, people ask me my process. He said, here's my process. I get up in the morning, I make coffee, I uh, get my New York Times, right. I open it, I drink my coffee, I read everything I'm interested in, and you know, I put it down, I go to the window, I look out the window, <laughs> I go back, I make another cup of coffee, I think maybe I missed something in the Times, I sit there, and when I can think of nothing else to do, right. I write. <laughs> it, it, because because it, 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 it is a lonely kind of a thing, and yeah. sometimes you have nothing. You know, I've many times sat down with no ideas come to you, but then something does, and it's exciting. Your parents were both um, musicians. Yeah. Um, what, do you, what do you think they would be most proud of with you? Wow. Uh, I've, my dad never made it to Vegas. Mm -hmm. You know, he passed away before. I think my dad, we'd be trying to figure out where he was. He'd be, <laughs> he'd be out seeing all the shows, hearing all the music. My dad would, would have loved living here in Las Vegas. Um, I think he would, be, he would be 
proud that and, and, and as a kid, you know, we, we watched Sammy Davis Jr. We watched Sinatra. We watched all these people who were playing Vegas. Mm -hmm. So Vegas became one of those things that was a, a, a goal, a destination, right. a, a dream, if you will. Mm -hmm. And I think my dad would be proud that I have had success in that area. Right. Uh, as for my mom, I, I think I think that uh, she would be most proud of the fact that at my age I still can sing. And, and, <laughs> and that's mainly because she taught me the right way to sing when I was a little kid. Mm -hmm. And when you think about going forward in yeah. your life, um, you think about retirement? No. Not at all? Never. I, and you look at somebody like Tony Bennett, for instance. Right. Yeah. But Tony, I guess he's not well right now, but, right. Uh, but you know, sang, you know, until, through his, until his 90s. I mean, I have things that I want to do. I have a play uh, that I've written, a, a, a musical, uh, that is getting a little traction right now. I, I really want to do that. And what do you want to do with that? What, I, what do I want to do with that? I'll tell you exactly what I want to do with that. I, I want to uh, uh, open it in New York. I've always said off-Broadway, mm -hmm. but we have producers now that are talking about maybe Broadway in a small theater. And I'd love to open it and do it for, I'm making this up, six months or a year. And then I would like it to tour without me so that I could sit at home, smoke cigars, Delegate. and get a check. <laughs> <laughs> and what is the, the, content, the context of the show? Well, it, it is about my, my family, mm -hmm. um, the, the white opera singing mother, the, the black jazz singing dad, and um, me growing up in, in a town where there were no people of color, literally, except our family. Uh, and, uh, China, and not Las Vegas? You're not not, no, no, I'm talking about a little yeah. town outside Buffalo, New York, okay. Farnham, mm -hmm. 528 people. Um, so I didn't even understand what my, the, 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 the African-American, the black part of my culture was until I got out of there, which was college. So, it, so I, I've, I've spent a lot of my life figuring out exactly where mm -hmm. I fit, which comes in a lot of ways, we, we, you know. Yeah. So that's really what the play is about. It, it's about coming from the, in the 50s, coming from that background and going out into the world and trying to figure out, you know, where you fit. Did, did your family suffer from discrimination, oh, yeah. racism? Yeah, oh yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, they met in England. Uh, Dad was in the United States Army. Mm -hmm. And in those days, the Army was segregated. So uh, there was the, the black soldiers and the white soldiers. And they were trying to get people to come to a USO show to sing and dance with the soldiers. And my mother, uh, who was an, an opera singer, volunteered. And that's how they met. They met at the USO show. She sang, and my dad asked her to dance. And boom, here I am. You know? <laughs> yeah. uh, so, but after the war was over, um, uh, my dad brought us over to the States, uh, to Buffalo, which is where his family lived. Mm -hmm. uh, and they had real issues. I mean, people beating my dad up just for walking down the street, mm -hmm. holding my mom's hand, that kind of a thing. So that's why we moved out of Buffalo to Farnham, where it, at least it felt safe. You right. know? Um, but the other part of that is, uh, I didn't get it. I didn't understand why people called me names. I didn't understand why they didn't like mm -hmm. me. And my dad was not the guy who would sit me down and go, okay, son, let me explain being black in America or being black anywhere. Mm -hmm. He wasn't that guy. He was the guy who said, you'll figure it out. Hmm. You know, so I kind of had to figure it out on my own, and, and that really happened when I got out into the world. Right. And sometimes that's for the better. I mean, sometimes you figure that, that out on your own, and it comes well, I think you have easier to. and quicker. I yeah. think you have to, right? Yeah. Uh, the, the only thing I, I would have said is I would like to have had a, a little bit more knowledge of what my cultural background as was as I watched things like uh, the Civil Rights Movement, as I watched Martin Luther King, as I watched mm -hmm. Malcolm X, as, to understand what that meant to me. I understood what was happening on the television set, mm -hmm. but I, I now understand what that meant to me and my children, you know, and my grandchildren, you know, and, and, and I wish I'd had a, a little bit earlier knowledge of that. It would have helped me in life, but I know it now. So have you had that conversation with your children? Oh yeah, um, uh, their mom, Brenda, it, it was, mm -hmm. is a great one for that. She, she really, pulled the wagon on, on that stuff, letting my kids understand what their heritage right. was, or at least what a part mm -hmm. of their heritage is. Uh, and yeah, we all have those conversations now. You, you've, you've <clears throat> met and performed with so many incredible people. I just wanted to ask you about a, a couple. Um, Ray, um, Ray Charles. Huh. I've never, I, I met Ray, but I've, I'm doing a show, I'm part of a show mm -hmm. called Georgia On My Mind. Um, and it's, it's, an honor, it's in honor of Ray's music. Uh, and the other people are Take Six, the group Take Six, and Nina Freelon and um, Kirk Whalem, great sax player. So I, I only met Ray once or twice in my life. I think I met him when he was doing the Joan River show when I was on that show. 
and, and another place. But I love singing his music. I don't sound anything like Ray Charles. I mean, mm, you right. know, they, they weren't looking for an impersonator. They, they were looking for yeah. just someone to, to do his music. And, and, and what about Joan Rivers? Uh, Joni's was a champion of mine. Yeah. She uh, went to the wall for me on a few occasions. Uh, when they were hiring, when she had her talk show on Fox, right. she uh, flew me out to L.A. to audition to be her announcer, right? And the deal was, you'll be the announcer, but you'll also sing with the band. And if a guest cancels, bam, you're on, you know, right? Great. So I flew out. <laughs> I auditioned. And the audition was Joan Rivers. That was the audition, right? Over and over again. And, uh, <laughs> uh, and I went back to my hotel and she called me in tears and she said, they don't want someone of color. They want because of her ethnicity, because Joan was, you know, her, her ethnicity so was a white part Jewish. of her act. Very <laughs> yeah, yeah. They want a blonde haired blue eyed and they had a specific person in mind. Mm -hmm. She said, but stay because I'm going to fight for you. So I stayed right. uh, the next day, which was a dress rehearsal. The guy didn't do well and they called me in. And literally the day the show opened was the first day I did the show. So when I say she fought for me, well, she, she yeah. really fought for me. She, she was just, just a great friend. You, you have good timing. Um, Ken, Ken Henderson is about to come on, but I wanted to ask you about... Wait a minute, he's going to be on camera? He's, yeah, on camera. Oh, my God. Because I, 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 I want to talk about notoriety for yes, a moment. Indeed. Yes, why, indeed. Is, why is it important to Las Vegas? Oh, uh, I, well, Ken will tell you his philosophy, you know, mm -hmm. but a large part of it was a place where people can perform that is not dictated by the confines and the needs of the strip hotels a place where a, a lot of talented mm -hmm. people who may not get a chance to be seen can come and be seen, and which can turn into something else and maybe five years from now they are on the strip. But um, that I think was part of the original concept for it. And, 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 right. and exactly what I'm doing here, I'm, I'm finding new things, I'm you know, helping to generate. And I, when is it? May, when are you here? May 8th. I'm here May 8th. May 8th, yeah. right? Yeah, you'll be here at Notoriety, and, and uh, look, you're, I know this week you're, uh, you're doing something for uh, St. Jude's as well. Uh, we'll yeah. We're airing a day after that, I think, but oh, great. this show. But, but, uh, but you still con continue to give back and back and back to Las Vegas, and, and we really appreciate that. I mean, you're yeah. synonymous you. with Las Vegas, and, um, you know, it's, uh, you, you can't separate the two. I mean, Las Vegas well, has been you. great for you, and you've been great for Las Vegas. Well, that's the point. I mean, they, they, it's been great to me, uh, yeah. giving me opportunities that I can't imagine that I would have in other places. So why not give back? Uh, you know, if I could write out million dollar checks, I'd do that. What mm -hmm. I can do is show up and, and try to be helpful and, uh, you know, just be there. So. Yeah. And what you can do is show up May 8th, notoriety <laughs> down here on Fremont Street. And we'll be, thank you so much, Clint. We'll be right back with Ken Henderson. Great to see you. Thanks. Thank you. Running past everywhere I've been, every choice I make. It's a chance I take, but if not now, when? But if not now, when? Back now with the creator of this wonderful theater, notoriety, <laughs> Ken Henderson. And, and Ken, you co-own the uh, the best agency, correct? Very large, established um, talent agency in town mm -hmm. with uh, probably what entertainers, models, uh, and all events, the, uh, yeah, production to yeah. that production, yeah. yeah. Um, why, why, in the middle of COVID, <laughs> come downtown to Fremont Street um, and then take a, an old, a, a movie theater, essentially, Correct. gut it, and, um, and turn it into a live entertainment facility with multiple stages in the middle of COVID? <laughs> Good question. Let me take that temperature. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let's take that. Um, you know... You know, obviously, COVID had, was not even a, a thing at the time. It took, a, it took a couple years to get to where we were getting. Mm -hmm. When COVID came out is right when we had started. The, the reason, um, I, I, I've had this concept of, of um, notoriety for quite some time, all the way back to 2005, but it was at a time when um, it was different than this. The concept was more, you know, record labels. I had a record label that I created. And I wanted to take, again, undiscovered talent um, and give them an opportunity and by bringing them into an environment where they had a stage to perform on, there was a bar there, and it had a recording studio. That was the original concept. And I was, Venetian was interested in having it. And, you know, and then, uh, you know, 2008 hit. And so it was 
always coming from a place and really coming from having the agency is representing talent and, and um, you know, you meet this, this I mean, there, this city is, the world is, but this city is full of talent. But where do you put them? You know, if you're not Bruno Mars, you're, the strip doesn't want you. And how do you get to be Bruno Mars unless you get to be seen? And that's kind of the concept behind this is just to give people opportunity to just do what they want to do that they wouldn't get to do somewhere else. And I always say, you know, people would tell me, well, you should get a, you know, a contract with them. So if they get discovered, you know, then you got a piece of them. And I said, I don't want a piece of them. I want a ticket. If, they're, if they make it big, I want to just call them up and say, hey, I get two tickets to your show. Right. That's fine for me. Um, it's about elevating the talent and giving them the right place to do it. Um, you, you see so many great talents, you know, sitting in a bar, you know, playing in the back of a bar and you're you people eating chicken wings and playing video poker and once in a while clapping. And it's like, this is first and foremost, a performance center. We have a bar, but that's secondary to mm -hmm. it. So when you're coming here, you're coming to see this person play. And that's what I want to do. And so far, man, it's it was such great response and and everyone's so grateful. And um, we're, I just try to create an opportunity, a deal that works for everyone. You know, we have to keep the doors open. So obviously, you know, we have to create a, a deal that is is kind of a universal thing. Um, but so far, everybody's been happy. Mm. And what about the name? Notoriety? Yeah, Notoriety. It, it was go all the way back to then. It's just it's 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 it is the the exact definition I used to know, but it's it's the it's about being discovered. It's about discovery. So if notoriety, if you're standing on the stage of notoriety, if, if you think of all the artists that um, I'm, I always go to John Mayer because I know I've read a lot about his journey. I mean, they played in all these little bars and all this. And at one point, somebody went, "This is the guy," you know, um, and uh, it, it, it is about artists that, when I deal with artists that um, truly, uh, I mean, I know you're, you're, you've talked to Clint Holmes, um, there's an artist right there that is just passionate about what he does. And, and wherever he plays, he plays. And, and that's the kind of people I want to work with that just love doing what they do. Because like anything, I guess, in life, it's, it's, it's you know, you may make it. Um, but if your journey isn't to make it, if your journey is just to do what you love to do, and if you get a paycheck for it, great. If you get a big paycheck, even greater. But, but I think those are the people that I've been working with that, that really, you know, just, just care about the craft. And um, that's who we're seeing, you know. And, and are you seeing um, locals come down here or tourists? I mean, what, what is the makeup of I think both. Clientele? You know, we just started with... Um, with the ticket brokers and stuff now. So it's mm -hmm. kind of, you don't see who, who they send in. There's, there's reports and stuff that you can get to, but um, you know, for instance, Clint uh, has got a show on May 8th. Um, he's very local driven. Um, I mean, he's got a, mm -hmm. you just have to open the door. I mean, people hear about him, they're like, right. you know, he, sell, he sold out. I mean, he sold out in the first couple of weeks, um, which is always the case with him. Um, other shows that we've done here, uh, the comedy shows, we have a magic show, mentalist show, Vinnie Grasso and, and David Goldrake and, um, we have a, a drag show. I think it's a big mix. I think it's a lot of downtown people here that are coming in. Um, we we have, the, they have the ability to go online and buy uh, tickets, um, but also we have people on the streets that are working, the, you know, the crowds that are coming and say, hey, you going anywhere? Because I th and even on the Strip, I've produced a show on the Strip. In fact, I produced Clint Holmes on the Strip called Between the Lines. And even having taxi cabs and the hotel was my partner having taxi cabs and and billboards and airport signs it, what i learned was people come to vegas kind of without a plan unless they're coming specifically to see someone huge but really they don't make a decision until the very last minute mm -hmm. so it's kind of like you don't know you just don't know what they're going to do so when we catch people down that are down here that are like looking around and wanting to just do something all of a sudden they go "Ooh, yeah i love magic yeah i'll come and they come to the show so it's been great it's so far. Let's talk about the facility in yep. here. I mean, you have um, multiple rooms. They do. Wait, you want to describe them? So and talk about we have them? a total of 70,000 square feet. Um, 70,000 square feet with a total of nine performance areas, ranging from 60 seats up to 400 seats. Um, and those are the ones that I didn't get to walk through with you. But um, we have there. Most of them are traditional movie theater type you know, just picture a movie theater. Right. Um, I've kept a screen in a couple of them, put a stage at the bottom, put sound, put lights. Acoustically, they're amazing because they were built to do that. Right, yeah. and, um, and then just pick the size. 
And so the idea is, if, if a lot of people are a little like, you know, who come here, they're like, oh, yeah, I'd, I'd like to do the 60 seat room because they're worried if they can fill it, you know? Um, and I said, you know, it works, whatever you need to do, and you can elevate them to the next seat, one or whatever. The room we're in today um, is 178 seats. Um, uh, if we put tables on the floor, once, once the guidelines change and we can do everything the right way, um, uh, 200 people. Um, and, you know, my experience is even in the big showrooms, even in the 700 seat showrooms, again, unless you're someone huge, an artist that sells out, I mean, if you're selling 200 seats, you're doing good. You're doing good. So we have the ability to do that, and we have been. I mean, it's, there's been a really a push right now of people just wanting to come out. We do it right, you know, we're still, we've always followed the guidelines, you know, temperatures and masks and, and, and social distancing with the tables and, um, you know, our, our staff cleaning tables. We've done it right the, the whole way. And um, I think that's been good for us because to hear people come in and go, I feel safe here. We have 30 foot ceilings. It's just a, it's just a good feel. Right. And, but that will end soon. Yep. And then when, when that ends and um, entertainers and, and guests are free to, to come in like the old days without masks, without social mm -hmm. distancing, How, what do you envision a year from now? I mean, do you see all these rooms operating at the same time of seven days a week? Um, what do you see? I, I do. Um, I, and that, that's the idea. The idea is you could come down here and um, maybe for a purpose, you know, to see whoever. And then that person says, hey, by the way, stick around. If you're going to be around later, we've got a huge comedy show, a da da da, so and so's coming. And you could literally just sort of stay for three, four hours. Um, uh, we, we serve pizzas. We have, we have food, which we started because the, that was part COVID. of the COVID guideline. Yeah. You had to have food. They caught on. Um, Mm -hmm. uh, they're amazing and people love them. So we're kind of expanding on that a little bit so we would have food. How, how about the hotel owners down here? Are, mm -hmm. are they are competitive with you or are they happy no, you're here? Happy we're here. Um, I'll tell you why. Um, um, because they want to keep their customer downtown. Mm -hmm. So if they, if they have to, so we've, we've gotten some partnerships with some great people. They've been here, they've walked through the, they're like, we love this. Because once you send them to the strip, where are they going to play after the show? You know, where are they going to eat after the show? It's probably there. And so they've been a big support. We only have, only have about 30 seconds left, but what do you have up, up and coming um, that's already booked in here that people well, should be aware of? Well, we've got Clint Holmes coming May 8th. Um, mm -hmm. There is r rumor, uh, Charo has come and looked at um, our theaters mm -hmm. and um, Coochie Coo. Yeah, right, Coochie yeah. Coochie. Yeah, so she's yeah. she's uh, interested. Um, we, we haven't made any deals yet, but um, I think that would be great because we don't have anything Latin coming. Mm -hmm. um, we've got some uh, kind of a boy band thing that's that's coming possibly from L.A. Um, boy, you have, just, you have the com you have the comedy shows you're comedy doing. Comedy show right? Laugh After Dark is coming starting May 22nd. Some, there's some charitable, there's some we other do, events. We do a here. lot of charity events here. Um, we have actually have our own 501c3. Uh, called uh, Notoriety Gives, and um, and they, they're calling. Hey, I want to I want to book the room for tomorrow night. And I'm, <laughs> <laughs> that was right through the. Bl I was blocked. Hey, this this is real TV. Yeah, this is real TV. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, but unfortunately, we're out of time. Okay. So, hey, Ken, thank you so much. Thank this you is for a, coming. A great establishment. People, you got to get down here. I, you're, you're filled up for Clint Holmes, but get down here for another show. It's a great great venue. Can do this. The reason that I have a greater woman to kiss. I know that if not now, when and if not now, when we may never pass this way again. So if not now, when, oh, if not now.